Lovely. Well, welcome, everybody. Lovely to see you all here today with us. Um, so this is our first episode of Digital Futures for Good. That's our new conversation series about what works in fixing the digital divide. Uh, we had this idea at the end of last year and now we're in it we kind of sometimes you wonder why you're doing it um, but absolutely thinking about 2024 and realizing you know that this is likely to be a general election year and also thinking about all the great people that we'd like to have a conversation with about their experiences their knowledge their evidence their ideas their opinions about what works um, from removing digital exclusion from our nation Sorry, the plan for the series. And sorry, someone talking. Please, can you mute everyone if possible? Um, so the plan is that we'll have ten episodes, and each one followed by a blog. And then after all of the episodes, we're going to be publishing a Digital Futures for Good report. And the blogs and the report will be uh, informed by obviously the uh, amazing guests that we're get, we're having in the series, as well as our expert commentators, but also from you, the audience. So please do put your questions and your comments in the chat panel, and we'll have a conversation um, at the end. Um, so the format today is shortly. I'm going to introduce our two expert commentators. So that's Liz and Hafsha. Um, and then I'm going to be showing two short excerpts from a 30 minute conversation that I had with Baronesses Dido Harding and um, Anna Healy. Um, and then uh, we will, Liz Hafsha and I will add some commentary, add some ideas, some expert ideas, hopefully, um, and some opinions for sure. Uh, and then throwing it open to questions and comments from you. And we'll wrap up before two. Um, so first of all, um, I'm not sure how you like the term expert commentators, um, but it is International Women's Day tomorrow. So I think we should be leaning in to our expertise. Um, so our two uh, experts are Liz Williams and Hafsha Dadabaha Sheikh. Sorry, Hafsha, please forgive me if I've said that Hi. wrong. Um, so uh, Liz, up to you first. So, and can you introduce yourself? What's your role, your day job, and your not so much day job? And why is digital inclusion important to you? Oh, I love that question. Hello, everyone, um, and thanks for asking me. Um, I'm Liz Williams. Um, I have the delight of uh, chairing the Good Things Foundation. Um, I have been a campaigner on digital inclusion for uh, intake of breath. Over 30 years, uh, both in the corporate world, leading the charge at BT Group, and more recently, um, my day job is all about uh, flying the flag for workforce digital skills. And I'm sure we're going to have uh, a great conversation off the back of the uh, the Baroness's uh, discussion. But and I don't like the term expert commentator, but hey, we'll take it. Did I answer the question? What was it? Was there another part I missed? No, 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 Sorry. that's lovely. Who, who are you and why is it important? Um, uh, and Hafsha, same question to you. What's your role? What's your day job? And why is digital inclusion important to you? Hi, everyone. I'm Hafsha Dadabai Sheikh. And yes, I'm a radio presenter. I'm a director of Smart Light Get Families Talking, uh, which we are a digital inclusion hub. I'm also an author and a mother. So yeah, I think that's my day job. Um, but the weekly radio show, Get Families Talking, it's hosted on a community radio station, goes out at prime time. Um, exciting chat show, which really aims to reinforce the learning that we do in the classroom um, and really to raise women and children's awareness and aspiration of opportunities around them. It's more than just a radio show. That's how I see it, because it's actually an approach to how we um, come across with learning, to be honest with you. So for us, why is it so important? Well, it's important because it's, it's an evolving world and it allows us all to connect. It allows us to speak the same language. It bridges that gap between young and old and different communities. But more than that, digital inclusion enables that fairer, more equitable world where everyone has access and can improve their health, their well-being, their employment opportunities, their educational aspirations, and how it leans into the future generations as well. We know it transforms, it changes lives and life chances, helps families and communities to aspire. So we've all got to be behind it. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Hafsha, and thanks very much for being here, um, Hafsha and Liz. So we're now going to go to our first excerpt with um, uh, Dido Harding and Anna Healy. Um, so one Conservative, one Labour, a Baroness from the House of Lords. So they are both on the House of Lords Communications and Digital Committee, um, and they were part of the committee's inquiry last year on digital exclusion that had a really great report and they had a really good debate in the House of Lords um, earlier, uh, about a month ago, actually now. Um, and so uh, I had a really great conversation with both of them about their work. Um, and this first excerpt is going to focus on digital exclusion in the round. And the second one is going to go more into those politics. So we're going to play the first film. I was about to say, go, Tash, play the first film. But I have to play the first film. So uh, please bear with me while I do that. Um, It's great to see so many people have joined us today. And it's such an important topic. So it's great that we're going to have this super conversation. And I love the fact that actually we can really involve the um, audience into the discussions as well. Absolutely. That's great. So let me see. Oh. So for both of you, you went to Skills Enterprise uh, in East Ham as part of the inquiry. What did you learn by visiting uh, Skills Enterprise, Anna? Well, I think, it, I mean, partly it was, it was it was great to meet you know, women who were beginning to feel empowered again, that they could actually, you know, seek work perhaps or do, look after their families better or, you know, access the health service. I mean, it, I mean, it is an empowering thing. Yeah. And, and and, I, and to give people confidence, you know, in their own abilities. I mean, not not necessarily through any kind of formal, technical new exams or whatever, but it's it's to build confidence of people that really want to access the you know all these different services. But I mean, it's a, it's a it's a long hard job, and it's going to take an awful lot of effort from so many people. I mean, I think your organisation does brilliantly, but, but and other charities too. But I think until we realize it's a national mission to get people um, digitally included, you know, that, that will require everybody to chip in. The women that we met there, it was wonderful to see that they, they were feeling empowered by having learned these skills that could give them the chance to access services and do things perhaps with their children or for their children that they couldn't do before because they didn't have the confidence. I mean, so it's both like the actual learning of the skills and the, and the whole um, improvement of their confidence and in actually involving themselves and maybe seeking work. I mean, it's all those things. It's amazing how it underpins everything nowadays, as you'll say, Dido. Yeah, I think Anna hits the nail on the head. I think that the word for me is confidence. And the fact that it was giving the, the women we met agency in their lives. It wasn't the digital skill per se. It was mm. that sense of confidence and ownership of their own lives, that it was a real sort of accelerator in their engagement in their community. And, and it reinforced for me that you know, actually addressing digital exclusion, it's, it's one of the, it's a wicked issue because people are excluded from multiple different set of reasons. That also was very clear in the visit, wasn't it? And so this is one element of the jigsaw puzzle and it has to be delivered locally. I think that was the other real proper reminder that it's about local community self-help rather than sort of top down diktat on how to do something. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's great that you could visit the digital inclusion hub and to see that for yourselves. I also love that you're both talking about empowerment and confidence because when we actually list why it's important we say make a gp appointment or apply for a blue badge it's all terribly transactional but so this is both the social justice as well as being able to be efficient and flexible and confident mm -hmm. services right before the pandemic i was a carer for my late mother and um she'd been fantastically fiercely independent a retired civil servant could do everything herself you know her banking her bills, her shopping, utilities, anything that she wanted, she could do. And, and then that all stopped because partly because of the pandemic and, and everything started to go online. And even before then, you know, the banks were closing, yeah. the utilities had to be, checks weren't acceptable, everything was increasingly going on online. And although she was keyboard literate, she, her sight was fading and it was too much for her to be able to take on the technology as well. And this was in her late 80s. So I began to do everything 
obviously for her because mm. I could, but I just thought, and, and her independence was just taken away from her. And I, th I thought that was so unfair. I mean, fortunately, she had me to help, but I was thinking of all those people yeah. in society who actually don't have younger family to yeah. help them or friends. So, you know, I began to realize what well, with all the services going online, what happens to people that are excluded. So, in the debate uh, on the 8th of February, um, Baroness Dow said that we are in danger of creating second class citizens. Um, I kind of thought, well, I think we already have created second class citizens. And I've heard you talk about a two tier public service. So do you think that's the society we're currently living in? Yes, I think we are living in a society today where uh, a, minor a minority of people um, are excluded for a variety of different reasons, and digital exclusion exacerbates that inequality. And, and I think we saw it very keenly during COVID. Um, the thing about infectious diseases is they prey on the most vulnerable. They always have done, they always will do. And add in digital exclusion. If you think of how many digital tools we used to enable people to live more normal lives during COVID, um, and imagine being excluded from all of those. So just to, it's a really concrete, real and, and present example of digital exclusion exacerbating existing inequalities. And the pandemic also meant the services, public and private, became more digitised. Spot on. So and we saw an acceleration yeah. of, the, yeah. of, of the good things of digital, making the contrast all the worse for people that we were leaving behind. And so that's why I sort of feel that actually... Ten years ago, lots of people used to say to me, don't worry, you can't force people to use digital if they don't want to. And, you know, they'll die in the end. Well, actually, what we've learned is that digital exclusion is a moving target. I think that was probably the single biggest take out of me from the, the Lord's inquiry that we did. But to remember that this job is probably never done and that you know, there will always be people on the edge of what technology is, is offering, and therefore, as a society, it's something we've got to care about always. It, I think you're right about technology moving, though. I think that the people at the bottom of this deep divide need to be brought up even to the very basics spot on. we enjoy today, right? Absolutely spot on. Indeed. And I mean, I know your work, you, you see that every day. And I mean, and, and the fact that we were able to go and see in real life that, that brilliant um, voluntary group in East Ham, the skills set and, and the work that you, you're all doing. I mean, you know, they wouldn't stand the chance to integrate and do just day to day things. Now, it's not it's not like an elite um, interest to be able to do things online. It's it's, a, it's fundamental, essential. I mean, I regard uh, digital inclusion as as absolutely essential as, as having access to any utility because it's, you know, you have to have There we are. So I'm, I'm, am I back? Are we all back? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that. You probably all like settled down and then it stopped suddenly, a bit like me. Um, but it's had a really great conversation. Um, Liz, coming to you first, very broad question. Was there anything there that surprised you or that, that particularly piqued your interest? Um, I'm, I'm quite, uh, given the people we've got on the call, I'm particularly interested. What I heard was, and by the way, there was loads I agreed with, loads I agreed with. So I'm going to start by saying I agree with loads of it. Um, but at the same time, I heard this thing about um, delivered locally, and that's really important. And, and I also agree with that. But that doesn't mean the community should self-organise. And I think the thing that, you know, I, there were so many paces things I heard there about how this is really important. This is core. This is, you know, this is about equality. So all really positive things. But actually, what does that mean in terms of our dire need for ambition and strategy and funding to enable the change to happen? So I had a bit of a, a visceral reaction to some of it because I kind of want them to, I, I know they do get it, but there's a really big a really big challenge to step in here and there's currently a vacuum absolutely and we're going to come on to the governmental back vacuum with our next excerpt but just focused on this first piece of this first clip and um, 
Hampshire. So they went to Skills Enterprise in East Ham, which is amazing. And we're really lucky that Marla is here, who welcomed them, the committee that is. So the whole of the committee went to um, Skills Enterprise. And um, the, partly I want to say, does that what they said resonate with you? But also that shift in mindset from seeing digital inclusion from a transaction to actually it be being about an essential and about the agency. Um, just tell us a little bit about, did it resonate? And, and, and what about that shift that we saw in, in their brains, having met the people um, in Skills Enterprise? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing that they did go. And I'm really, really pleased that they did do that effort to really understand what it means for communities to try and come together and to become digitally included. And it is, it is about agency, it is about confidence, it is about empowering. But the things that they probably didn't see, and this is probably something that resonates with a lot of the community groups who are on this call, and that is, you know, it, it's about the safe places that these organisations provide. And it's the work that goes into encouraging those people to actually come to those centres. And that can mean something as simple as meeting on the corners of familiar roads. It can be meet, meeting in familiar spaces, like a local library, like um, a school where the children go, before that learner actually has the confidence to then come into your centre. And it's about all that effort that goes into making sure that there are some you know, refreshments available because we know, especially with the cost of living crisis as well, women particularly will suddenly find that they don't have time for breakfast. And there are many other reasons for that. But it's, it's having those refreshments there because learning on an empty stomach is incredibly hard. And it's about respecting those, you know, cultural, familial constraints that hold people back from actually attending these centres. So I'm really, really, you know, that an incredible amount of hard work goes into ensuring that those people, people can come into centres and learn and addressing the learning that they need so that they can move forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And I and I think, you know, sometimes we can use terms like holistic support um, and yeah. not really understand what that means. But you're right, it's it's the it's the food as well as and the we often talk about informal, friendly, comfortable. It's about how you learn. Liz, just in your role, your day job as chief exec at Future.Now, um, obviously you um, are involved a lot about skills, digital skills. And that bit that Dido was saying at the end about um, this job never being done, I'm not sure I totally agree with that. But just could you talk to us a little bit about your view about that moving target and how do we make sure that people have the skills as technologies change? Yeah, I, I actually think she might be right, Helen. And I know you want to believe that that there's a job and there'll be a point in the future where everybody will be digitally included. And I, I think people will be digitally included up to a point, but because technology keeps moving, and it goes back to, I suppose, what they were saying about confidence. I think confidence is so important because if someone's got confidence then they've got the ability to move to the next learning thing, the next challenge. But if you look at what's happening with AI coming over the, the you know, the, the, the hill or whatever it is, it's coming over, that brings a whole different suite of, of problems and opportunities. Uh, I mean, the number of people that have said to me, yes, but this problem is a bit like what Dido was saying actually about, you know, the old answer was people are gonna die and therefore this problem will go away because it's just about old people. And now it's uh, people saying, well, AI is gonna mean that you're not gonna need to have the core digital skills because the system will do it for you. But that's not right. Actually, we, we live in a world that is completely and utterly powered by digital. It's a complete, it's not a societal issue, it's a system issue. There's been a massive change. And that that pace is going to change. If people haven't got the digital foundation, the confidence, they're going to never catch up. And actually, as technology advances, that will create huge, huge inequality. You've only got to see it now. If you want to apply for a job and you haven't got digital skills, how do you find that job? How do you write your CV? How do you get in front of an organization? I don't know how you do that. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this the the pace of change with technology means that there will always be a need to just constantly 
uplift our skills. People use that buzzword of lifelong learning. I think I think that's real, but I think we need to start breaking that down into specifics of what that really means. Absolutely. Um, I think one thing that we've seen in this first excerpt is how we've got two influential um, decision makers, people of influence, completely understanding the depth of digital exclusion and the impact of digital exclusion um, on people, um, millions of people across the UK. So now Liz asked for more ambition and strategy. So let's do let's, let's go to the second the second film that we've got. Um, I'm going to um, demonstrate my moving digital skills by sharing my screen at the same time as talking. Um, so we'll go to this, the second uh, excerpt from the conversation with Dido and um, Anna. So let me share my screen and... Who do you think is responsible for fixing the digital divide? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, the trite answer is we all are. Oh, Helen, the sound's just gone. Acted from modern life. Well, whether you're a professional politician, a business leader, a mum, a teenager, you know, if you care about society, you should care about this issue. So I'd argue that it's something, and I actually think to fix it requires more than pointing to senior politicians, though I'd like the senior politicians to care about it too. So the last try answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my big theme in, in this conversation would be we need the Prime Minister to care. Because this is a complex, you know, multi-agency problem. And we know that societies don't make those changes without leadership from the very top. Absolutely. And Anna, who do you think is responsible for fixing the digital divide? Well, I mean, I agree that it absolutely has to be the Prime Minister taking the lead and showing to people all different aspects of society that we've got to do this together. I mean, we've got to make it a national mission that everybody can buy into, and that's business, voluntary groups, the, the government, local authorities. I mean, everybody has to really up their game. And the Prime Minister, who cares? That would be great, wouldn't it? Do you think this is a doorstep issue? Well, I think that's a, that's a very good point. I mean, I guess anything that makes people angry will always be a doorstep issue. But also, I think it's fear on people's part, which is perfectly understandable because even if they may feel that they can cope now because of this fast pace of technology and the event you know of artificial intelligence i think there's a lot of fear out there and and and, and people are wondering well you know are, are my employers going to help me skill up or you know will it be something the government will do and what will happen if i just can't do it you know and uh, and everybody's having to work longer as well you know so you need to keep your skills up updated all the time you can't just think well i you know i've learned this and that i'll be fine for the next 10 years because that's not what it's going to be like so i mean i think i mean hopefully you know if it's a manifesto issue which i hope it will be in in our manifesto but i can't i haven't i'm not empowered to confirm that of course but then people could start talking about it and we need everybody needs to start talking about it, it can't be just hidden away i think that the People being scared of the pace of change is a very real doorstep issue. And so I'm thinking aloud a bit in this conversation, helping politicians see that addressing the root causes of digital exclusion could be one of the ways that you help society move forward rather than being, being afraid of the changes that actually could bring benefits. This is, this is frustratingly, I said in the, the Lord's debate, a Cinderella issue. For me, and I think probably for all three of us, it's self-evidently obvious that the, the economic case is really clear. Um, the social case is really clear. And actually, there's really good evidence that the general public wants this. So that makes the political case really clear. So I'm mighty frustrated because it seems to me that for the best part of 15 years, really, governments haven't acted on this now so the question is what what changes and from from my perspective i think the thing that needs to change maybe is we've got to find a way of helping people see that this unlocks the sexy exciting mm. stuff 
that actually you can't be a science or an AI superpower if you haven't got a digitally included population. You can't have a sort of digitally enabled health system if you've got some of your most vulnerable population unable to engage digitally. No, you can't have sort of digitally enabled and enhanced education if people can't access the internet when they go home to do their homework. So I think maybe we've got to link it to the sunlit uplands as well as the obvious sort of social justice and fundamental economic issues that we think are so obvious. Imagine we have a general election and you're elected prime minister. Okay. <laughs> Unelected peer. Anyway, <laughs> we, we, we. Um, so just imagine, suspend disbelief that you're elected prime minister. What would you do for digital inclusion in your first 100 days? Gosh, well, I think I would call my cabinet together and say this is going to be one of our top priorities because without sorting this problem, we can't do all the other things that we're trying to do in terms of the economy, in terms of health services, etc. I mean, so so they would be clear about what we do, what our mission was. And then I think I'd also possibly call a round table of business leaders because I think they sh they need to be involved and they need to know that I was, re as prime minister, was going to say to them, look, we've all got to step up here. You've got the skills as well. So let's try to get to work in partnership. That's two things. And obviously, I would set up a delivery unit, three things in 100 days. That's quite a lot. I hope I would start at least to begin the process. The first thing you have to do is show that this is a real priority. So you need to convene something. You need to speak publicly, personally, as the Prime Minister, to show why this is an issue that connects with the rest of your platform that you are personally going to be committed to, first thing. You need, then need to back that up with some actions. So you need to appoint a team. That team needs to report to you pretty regularly. And that team needs to know that they that you've got their back and that you will back them up when they reach the inevitable um, you know, blockages and problems and challenges. Um, and then you need to give them permission to try some stuff and to get on with it. Um, those are the three things I do in the first 100 days. In some ways, the frustrating thing about this is that it's not that hard, actually. We're not asking for a huge amount of our leaders' time but we are asking for determination and commitment and visible leadership that this is something that will really make a difference to society. So we get it. Yes. Um, so Lovely. Thanks very much. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I've actually heard it a few times and obviously I was there in the room with them, but I still find that very inspiring. Um, and really useful. And my digital skill that I learned is I can't mute while I'm showing a video. Um, so um, uh, Liz, hopefully you're with us. I mean, that was really powerful stuff. I think that um, one of the questions that I haven't shown you today, so you're gonna have to look at the whole film to hear um, Dido and Anna's answer was that with this level of commitment from the conservative, from House of Lords, from peers, from the Conservative Party, from the Labour Party, from the Lib Dems, from the Greens, the crossbenchers, there's a bishop. They all spoke in the debate and all said this is important and it's important for our country. And as Dido said in that clip, there's a clear economic issue, social issue and political, sorry, economic case, social case and political case, is that why do we think politicians, not all politicians, of course, some politicians absolutely are listening and are hearing and do agree. But but why do you think we're not getting through? So, uh, Liz, let me come to you first that, you know, I guess the question is, why not? And how could we? That's a question I wish I knew the answer to, because <laughs> if I knew the answer to it, we'd, we'd be doing it. But I mean, I've spoken to a number of people about that. And, and one of the thesis that's come up is, and, and I quite like it, I'm attracted to it, is that it's been put on the too hard step. It's like it's too complicated. It's too big. We've tried and we've not been successful. And we've got such short term vision in our political system at the moment. It's all about what can we show now? We need a big announceable. And this is not a sexy big announceable. It's because it's so fundamental. So that for me is probably the unblocker. But I think the way to drive change, and this is certainly what we're doing around at Future.now around workforce digital skills, 
is to lay out the plan to say, right, okay, this is what needs to happen. And this is how it's actionable. And then to start to bring people around it and go with the routes that you can get influence on. So with our work on business skills, we're, we're talking to business, business will eventually get to government, but government are not gonna come to this based on what I've seen. Although, you know, let's hope in the next election that changes. But, you know, I, I think we're, we're quite a long way um, from that. But they're absolutely right, by the way, that this is the key to unlocking those big ticket things that every government wants to deliver for our country and therefore I cannot I keep you know one of the things that frustrates me is the inability to get that message across so maybe we need some even better comms people really working on on that how do we create that link to the things that really matter because this is fundamental and as Dido says is communicating how it unlocks the sex. yes so you know once we they have their sexy stuff laid out that this is is unlocking it. Um, uh, Hafsha, I mean, obviously you're looking at this from lots of different perspectives. Um, why do you think we're not getting through? And do you have any ideas of how how we could help them to to see how critical digital exclusion is? Right. Do you know? Whilst I've been sat here, I've been thinking about somebody, and that is Erling Haaland. So. <laughs> Some of you will know what I was doing yesterday evening. And Erling Haaland was on and an interviewer asked him just before the match, is it about scoring goals? And he said, no, it's about winning. And that to me sums it up because it's not just about scoring the goals. And I just feel at the moment, with a levelling up strategy in place, this is what we're all doing in isolation. The MPs, the cabinets, nobody's tying up. Actually, that digital inclusion cuts across so many different sectors. Everyone's doing it in silos. And what we all need to be doing is thinking, actually, it's not about each individual goal or the goal scorer. It's about winning, it's about the team winning, and this is team digital inclusion winning across the nation. That's the only way that we can move up. And when we think that, you know, living in, because we work in de deprived areas, and as do a lot of people on this call. So we know that when you live in a deprived area, you are three times more likely to die prematurely you're three times more likely to go to hospital to be treated for a treatable condition. You're more likely to have long-term ill health. And always for me, it's about the impact that it has on the children. So this is a gift that keeps giving. This is the legacy of it. And only, I think, was the early part of this week, um, I saw another report from National Literacy Trust and it said that one in four children live in poverty, but one in five children between the age of five to eight will actually leave primary school with very low literacy levels. And it's those children who will then go on to struggle with their GCSEs. They will more likely face unemployment at the age of 30. And when you track back on it, it's all because their parents were digitally excluded. And that for me is just heartbreaking. And it's those sort of figures, when we think about it, those societal issues could be resolved now. And we're talking about, what was it, Liz, uh, Helen, you mentioned? 25 million pounds per annum. That's all it takes. And that's an absolute drop, a drop in the ocean. Why can we not simply get this money? It's organizations. And I love the fact that actually the question around, you know, the first hundred days. And yes, I totally agree. But I would say, please, when we have that round table, it needs to be business leaders, but we also need a community voice there. We need the community voices there because so, so often what we find is that these are the voices that are drowned out and they're drowned out because there's a lot of noise around digital inclusion now. But quite often, 
because their voices are drowned out, they know the solutions to their problems, but we're too busy answering and making up the solutions for them. So we need to make sure that communities are involved in the solutions. Sorry, Helen, I, will, I, I will no, shut no, up. Helen, could I come back on a couple yeah. of things that Hafsha said there? So firstly, um, I don't think it's about team digital inclusion. I think it's about team UK. Um, and, and, and because uh, it's that fundamental thing that says this is, you know, this is a societal issue. They call it a societal issue. I, 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 I don't think it is a, it is a societal issue, but I think it's much bigger than that. We've seen a system change. We've seen a, it's therefore a system issue. It's something that is not more, it requires more than a few tweaks. It actually requires us to make some fundamental changes to the way that we do, we do things. And that's about equipping people in, in our world. But I also think that that point that you were making there about the, work of the experts and I'm not going to call them the community groups because they're they are the experts and I feel I, I'm honored always to be in Hafsha's presence because she knows so much about this and she makes change happen and there are lots of Hafshas up and down the country so that thing about where I was saying you know a roadmap for action that's specific that's actionable that is really they're able to pick up and run with we need to be you know saying those things like you know yes okay yeah get the business leaders along but actually we know the answers on this. Let's tell you what the answers are and hear it from these people who actually know what's there. And, and I don't actually think it is about more money. I think it's about there's a whole ton of wasted money in the system, the kinds of thing that Hafsha was talking about, that if you just redirected it, you would get to different outcomes. I'm going to get off of my soapbox. Sorry, everyone. That's right. I'm going to ask you some questions from the audience. So um, I just want to read out something that Jess Flack has written um, because she says, let's take a leaf out of Elwood's book from Legally Blonde. Uh, could we take a look at the portfolios of cabinet members and map the impact of digital exclusion has on their strategic interests and approach them directly that way? Remove the bubble of you don't know what you don't know. I think that's a really great um, comment. But um, Anna Dent has asked a question here, which is how can we... Um, stop relying on under-resourced organizations to deal with the problem and i think i guess this is about flipping it around that and i think it's what hafsha and liz what you've been saying is that if it's seen as a local issue and that charities and community organizations are picking that the safety net is working let's say let's yeah. put it that way then is that also one reason why um nothing's happened nothing at that let's say the current government, like the current government is not prioritizing this and is not investing in it and is not even pulling together a strategy or any kind of action plan. Um, but so do, do, I mean, one, I guess, is do you agree with, with Anna there? Ha and how do we um, turn that around to make the resources to go to the people who are providing that safety net, but also to understand how we do that at a you know, local, regional, national, UK level? Um, uh, system change, I guess, Liz, as you were saying. Um, do you want to come in, Liz? Yeah, I suppose so. Mm. I don't know the answer, though. Um, on the first question, um, which was more about that question about going to people and making it personal yeah. to them, I think that's really important. But you won't, you can invest a lot of time in that. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, where we've seen the, the current government so many changes each time I think you've had a breakthrough you know we've seen personnel changes so I think we've got to make that case on both levels and I think on the the point about um community groups and you know is that acting as a barrier because they think the community will solve it I think that's where organizations like good things come in because you are a very powerful voice representing those community groups and 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 bringing that uh, in a different way and saying yes look the community is doing this but actually these are the issues for the community groups and this is why this issue matters here's the economic case here's the this here's that you know actually all that lobbying so I think that convening above it the community groups is really important because the last thing we want is for the community groups not to be there and that's you know that's part of the story that we've got to build is that yes of course it requires ambition at a national level yes it requires strategy at a national level but it also requires the people that know what the local people need to be doing the magic that they do that means people get digitally included absolutely and and Hafsha I mean obviously you're 
you're there picking up some of those pieces in the community. So how how do you think we can make sure that the resources are one, I guess, coordinated and, and also that you can rely on it and that, that it keeps coming? So uh, just, just, just comment on, on that from, from Anna. So I just want to actually move this a little bit further on from what Liz was just saying. Okay. Um, so a full stop there and then just carrying on from that point. And I just sort of thought, you know, you know, thanks to the National Data Bank, we've distributed over 1500 data SIM cards. And when I think about it, it's not just about data cards going to families and to individuals to become more digitally included. This is actually about those telcos going into people's homes. It's about those telcos changing the narratives and the discussions that families are having. It's about them suddenly being more aware of these organizations. And suddenly it's that discussion of, well, who is, for example, VMO2, who is Vodafone? Who is this company? What are the opportunities there? What, what could we possibly, what could they possibly do for us? And what can we possibly do for them? So it's about children and young adults thinking about job opportunities and things like that and thinking, well, actually, how can we change this world now that we're in to make it better? So for me, I always think that that's actually leveling up because we, we don't re almost realize that actually, you know, in that here and now, we're giving somebody data to solve that immediate problem that they might have. But this is really, really leveling up. And it's almost like we need to be shouting and saying, look at these creative solutions that have already come forward. They require minimum effort, minimum funding behind it. But it's having people who can think creatively like this and a willingness to work together. That's how we change this. But and is that about so vision and directions, Hasha, as well? So I, if you take the example of the, the data bank, that is yeah. about understanding the problem. I mean, I can remember us yeah. sitting there during COVID, understanding the problem in a way, providing direction on what needs to happen and a vision of how to achieve it, and then going out there and making the case. Because yes. frankly, those organisations would not be giving those that, that that data in the way that they they are if it hadn't have been for the work that the team at Good Things Foundation have done to create that. And the same with devices, which is a, a similar problem. I mean, I, I when I heard Dido saying on in the first, you know, when she was talking about, you know, the inequality exacerbated by digital, and she was talking about COVID and what happened there. And it absolutely just took me back to that time when we were looking at those issues. We didn't need to imagine it. You were seeing it. You were dealing with it day in, day out. You understood exactly what people needed, how they needed it, and what that needed to look like. And Helen and the team were able to take that and translate that into new strategic activity when we came out of the pandemic, which yeah. I'm very proud of, by the way. I think the team did a cracking job with that. Thanks, Liz. I think I was also going to say there was some hard work there too, have sure. Like, um, um, I think the... Um, but um, the other thing that... I think it's extraordinary with the National Data Bank because we've also had some, we, we have Good Things Foundation Australia as well, and we've had some conversations with telcos in Australia, and we haven't managed to achieve what we've achieved in the UK because those mobile operators are willing to collaborate with each other, although they are competitors in the commercial space, in the in, in the recognition that they have a product that can actually end financial insecurity um, around providing that internet for free, then actually they're aware that by working together, they're going to be able to reach more people and working obviously with, with ourselves at a national level and then yourself, Hafsha and many people on the call at that local level as well. But talking about private sector, I also just want to say great that um, Virgin Media A2 and Vodafone are also strategic partners. So they're also here as a strategic funder making that work as well, not just providing those sims. But we have um, Stephen here from uh, the Tridos Bank, and he's saying, given that banks are moving to mobile first banking, what role can we as banks play, not just to help our own customers, but to improve digital inclusion as a societal issue? That's a very live issue, and we're talking to lots of different banks. Um, so uh, Liz, do you want to come in with some ideas for Stephen? 
yeah i mean there's there's so i mean the first one is like let's be really tactical can you give can you give all your laptops please to people like hafsha as part of the device bank and and that's just a really <laughs> you know let's get that circular economy thing powered by the by the uh the corporate sector but actually banks are in people's homes um you know they are they are i'm going to say it trusted but also what i hear is i hear most of the narratives from banks is about stopping scams it's not about the positives it's not about how this can open your world it's actually quite a scary message so i think there's also something as well as providing and sponsoring and using your branches to run drop-in centers with the community don't create your own programs please use the community they know what they're doing but at the same time think about that narrative that you're sending because if your only narrative is about stop the scam stop the scam stop the scams that's going to really frighten people and they're not going to want to really experiment with this um and uh Hafsha. yeah just totally want to second that and just say fintech needs communities they can't work in isolation they need the communities um so yeah please let us have some more digital champions give us community champions people out there who will come and explain and work with the communities to show that actually it's not scary scams there's more to banking online yeah, and it's great to be able to work with the National Digital Inclusion Network. So with thousands and thousands of those hyperlocal with uh, local organisations like yourself, Hatcher, and thousands of others more, and lots on on the call today, which is amazing. Um, I'm just going to ask you both a question, which is related to International Women's Day. So, um, it was a complete fluke chance if you like that um it was two baronesses who um that who we approached to talk to us about the work of the committee and of course both of you are leaders in your own fields um that i just want to say this that i love men and i have two sons um, so that uh just reflecting that it's international women's day tomorrow which is a huge global event um uh, I'm sure you're both going to be slightly embarrassed about this, but you are both role models. Um, and how do you see that that you could do more to role model how you have achieved what you have achieved as women in a society where there is still prejudice uh, uh, against women in 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 some cases in some circumstances so yeah just think of yourselves as role models and, and what more do you think you could do what more could i do or the baronesses do and and anyone else men and women who are in the audience today so liz let's let's kick off with you no, start with hafsha okay hafsha start with you <laughs> okay so i have to admit when i have when I teach a group of women, I always say to them, particularly over International Women's Day, we have a session in the classroom and I will always say that you are the Prime Minister, you are the Chancellor of Exchequer, you are the Department of Education, the Secretary for Education in your own homes. And then I let it sit. And they look at me in awe because they think, well, how on earth can that be? And I'll say, well, who makes the decisions? Who makes the decisions actually on how you are going to spend your money and what you are going to buy? Who does the shopping in your homes? Who buys the school uniforms? And who decides when, you, where your children are going to go for school? And suddenly they wake up and suddenly you can almost see their shoulders going back because they realize that actually they are women of power. For a lot of women, particularly in communities where they are learning language, that comes almost second because for them, it's about doing those tasks at home. It's about the cultures that hold them back. It's about the familial expectations which say you can't learn. We have women who have no control over their financial digital you know, lives. And suddenly they come into our sessions like they do to so many other hundreds of community organizations. And they realize that actually they are women in their own rights they have their own individual power, but they just need to be able to express it. So it's great because 
we don't realize it, but actually digital inclusion gives them that power. So we can't stop. We, we've just got to carry on. Helen, sorry, you've got to wear that badge that says superstar, because I tell you what, all the women that we come across are superstars and they're all role models, not just us. Absolutely. Liz, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's really important to provide platforms to people like Hasha, um, who I do think is you know, an example of a, a real leading woman who drives change. And there are lots of them within the Good Things Foundation Network. Um, on a personal level, um, I I recognise that as in, in my career that I have had a variety of self-limiting behaviours and um, I, I didn't even really know what that term meant. So I'm just going to lay that out there as a really good example of I had to look it up when someone started talking to me about it because I don't come from the kind of that background where all these buzzwords mean stuff. So, but what I try to do in my my life is I try and talk about authentically the things that are going on and the points in my career where I might have required a nudge for somebody or I might not have seen it in quite the same way. And I, I try to do that in a way that I hope is um, uh, identifiable with others. So I hope that others can see it and, and respond to it and it maybe means something to them. And I also try to make sure that I talk to girls and women about their careers and how good they are or how far they could go because I can remember a point when someone challenged me and said did you know you could do this or, or I see you at this point and nobody ever said something like that to me and I held it and it mattered so I think playing it back with others is is really important but being an authentic leader about and not pretending you're something you're not but but being open about your story really important fantastic thank you both that's really inspiring for International Women's Day. Um, so that's it for today for the first episode. Hopefully everyone has enjoyed it. So coming up in future episodes, we have Martha Lane Fox. We have Emma Reavy, who's the chief exec of the Trussell Trust. We have Andy Burnham. We're going to be focusing uh, one episode on health with uh, Sam Shah and Minal Bakal. Um, and the next one drum roll is on April the 11th. So I hope you will want to be tuning in on April the 11th for the next one. Um, also, I hope you've also been, uh, you've spotted on social media that it is a uh, campaign month for Good Things Foundation, some amazing billboards. Hopefully you've seen the billboards across your towns and cities um, featuring uh, the stories um, for a digital for all for, for uh, throughout March. And obviously those stories are on the website as well. So thank you so much. Um, and all of the attendees today are going to get a, a link, get an email with a link to the full video and uh, to the blog. Um, and obviously we're going to be um, doing this many times throughout the year, looking at digital inclusion and how we fix the digital divide from dis different perspectives. But obviously we're also going to be making sure that we're reading all of your comments in the chat panel um, because we want your view as well as these experts and thought leaders that we'll be talking to about building that case um, so that we can once and for all fix the digital divide. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much for your comments and thank you so much to Liz and Hafsha and obviously to Dido and Anna for talking to us um, for the film as well. Thank you everybody. Thanks Helen. Thanks. Thank you.